Hello and welcome to Paragon's Favorite Stuff, where I show you all the things that we love to have aboard our 42-foot sailboat named Paragon. In the last couple of videos, I introduced you to our Singer Heavy Duty Sewing Machine. I showed you how it works, I showed you all of the many things that we've sewn with it, and then we used it to sew a patch onto a tear in the leech of our mainsail. If you'd like to check out those videos, then you can click on the links in the video description. In today's video, we're going to check out the undisputed champion of marine sewing machines, the Sailrite LSZ-1. Our Singer Heavy Duty Sewing Machine is absolutely perfect for things like mending clothes, hemming pants, we even used it to make these wonderful curtains for our port lights, and also to sew a zipper onto our canvas enclosure. But for sail repair, it was really hard for the machine to send the needle through four layers of sail material. We were able to do it, but the end result was just really sloppy and probably not as strong as it could have been had it been done with a more capable machine. After that, I got in touch with a man in Shetland who is an expert at repairing sewing machines. He has a workshop where he has a whole bunch of different sewing machines, including a Sailrite LSZ-1. When he said that he would be glad to show it to us, we decided to sail to Shetland. So here we are anchored in Scalloway, Shetland. It is a beautiful little town and it is a wonderful place to be anchored in. I'm just going to get in the dinghy and we're going to row ashore and go to Davy's shop. Here in Scalloway there are a whole bunch of places where you can land the dinghy and just drag it up onto the shore and tie it to something. It's very accessible. It's a really nice anchorage. I'm taking my e-bike to shore as well so I can go for a little ride later. Guy. Hey, you're, the internet is real. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing us your shop and your Sailrite machine. Come and have a look. All right. Got a few other machines out for you to see. Oh, wow. That thing is huge. <laughs> wow. That's what everybody says. <laughs> I take it you do want a coffee. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. What do you use this shop for? Well, technically, it's my wife's studio. So really it's her workshop uh, and I've kind of moved in and I have I have a corner over here where I do my sewing machine repairs and then occasionally when she's not here I get to use all of the space. <laughs> she made this artwork right here in this shop. Yep. Yeah. Well thank you for showing us your Sailrite machine. Mm. This is it, huh? This is it, yes. So that's it's, not uh, the box. No, um, sale, it's right? not the sail right box. This is a custom hardwood box. It's a little stronger. Well, there's nothing wrong with the sail right box. This is just a bit heavier and a bit stronger. What makes a sail right machine great for sewing sails? It's not the best machine for making sails or, or for sewing sails, but it is the best machine to have on a boat for doing sail repairs and sail making because it has such a wide range of capabilities. If you were making sails in a sail loft, you wouldn't use a sail right. There are bigger and more appropriate industrial machines that will do that job and they'll do that job a lot better. But the thing with the sail right is it can make a sail. It can also fit under your bunk in a boat. Uh, you can also carry it and stick it in the back of your car. So that versatility is the strong point with the sail right. It's a bit like a Swiss army knife. It's not the best machine at any one thing, but it can do everything to an extent that is enough for people on boats using sails. Huh. Are there any cons to this machine? It's heavy. It's heavy. It's... 24 kilos. 24 kilos. Wow, really 
heavy. So that, that is the downside of it. But the plus side of having that extra weight is it doesn't move around when you're working with it. It's a lot better at staying in one place. Whereas when I've done repairs in the past with domestic machines, they're very light and they move around. And if the sail moves, they take the machine with them. So having that weight does actually help the work. Hmm. And this wheel is very heavy. So the momentum of that turning helps to transfer the force of movement to penetrate the sails or penetrate whatever it is you're sewing. Hmm. You can attach this handle and that turns your electric machine into a, a hand operating machine. That now turns very easily by hand. If you're working on the boat and you don't have power, you could do the whole job just by hand. Can you do anything with this machine by hand? That yeah, absolutely. And in, in reality, your hand is more powerful than the motor. Wow. So if you get to a part that the motor struggles with, turning it by hand will give you a lot more power. Wow, that's fantastic. So you can take this machine anywhere, any boat, any location. You can work anywhere in the world. Yeah. Don't need power. You don't need power, no. That's fantastic. Mm. So we've got stitch length. So stitch length goes from six millimeter to zero. And it also does the same in reverse. We've got stitch width. It does something like maybe eight millimeter zigzag. We then have a uh, needle position so we can move the needle from left, center and right. They are all pretty standard on most machines. It has a bottom feed, which is this bit coming up. And that's what you see on most sewing machines. So that will catch the fabric and then it will drag the fabric back as you sew. But the sail right has this walking top foot. So that comes down and meets the bottom foot. And then the two of those move together. Uh, between stitches and that is what makes a massive difference when you're doing heavy duty work or multiple layers so if you're doing a long seam on a standard uh, sewing machine what happens is the friction from the foot slows the top surface down whereas the drive from the bottom causes that one to speed up so if you're doing a long seam, like a few meters long, like if you're doing on a sail or, or, a, or a big piece of canvas for something, you end up with a slip where the top fabric slides over the bottom fabric. Mm. So when you get to the end, um, you find that they don't match up, even though they might have matched up at the beginning. So the walking foot gets rid of that because it grabs the two pieces of fabric and feeds them two at the exact same rate. So for longer seams and for thicker fabrics or multiple layers, the walking foot is a is a real a real boost. To be honest, if you're just doing small patches on a sail, you don't need the walking foot. If you've got a machine that's powerful enough to actually penetrate, there's like the Singer 20U, which I've got over there, the black one. I use that a lot for sail repairs if it's shorter seams, because there's no issue with that movement. But if I'm doing longer or if I'm doing multiple layers, then I'd, I'd probably get the sail right out. It's a lock stitch machine which means it has a bobbin underneath and a bottom thread. The bottom bobbin is a little bit tricky to get at, but it's basically just the same as in standard domestic machines. So nothing unusual there if you're familiar with the machine. We can either put a thread on there as you would in a normal machine, or we can use these bigger spools. It comes to this pin and the pin is its kind of first regulating device. It then goes through these other points. And this is all to kind of smooth out the movement of the thread from the loose thread to a controlled thread. It then goes through the tension device and the check spring. The check spring is there to keep the thread tight so that you don't get a loop of loose thread underneath the needle. So if your check spring is not there or it's not working, there's a possibility of a loop getting underneath the needle which would cause problems with the sewing. We then have the take up arm, which is this arm in here. And then there's a thread guide at the top of the needle and then through the needle. So once we've got the thread through the needle, we then need to bring the bottom thread up. Can I see how the Sailrite machine does going through four or more layers? I thought you'd never ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can just start with four, can't we? And then I can double that and do it. 
from four to eight? Yeah, really? so we'll, we'll just start with four. There's no point in starting with one because we all know it can do one. Yep. And I'll just do it by hand. I can't believe you just sewed a zigzag stitch through four layers of sail material by hand. Yeah, it was, it was actually easy. So that's four. So if we double it, that'll give us eight. This is a pretty heavy sail as well. Yeah. So it was a bit tougher to get going. You can definitely feel it. But once you go in, it's, it's fine. So that's eight layers. And you can see it's managing no problem with the zigzag on that. I don't know if it'll manage 12, but we could give it a shot. Normally, if you can get it under the foot, it'll sew. But I don't know if I'll be able to, to drive it through. How many layers? 12. 12? <laughs> Wow, that looks perfect. It's not quite up to the eight, but it's, yeah, it's good enough. And that's 12 layers. When I used my Singer Heavy Duty to sew a zigzag stitch on the patch on my sail, it was so sloppy. I can't believe that's through 12 layers. Part of the reason you had an issue with the Singer is because you had all of the sail and the weight of the sail that would have affected that movement. And without the walking foot to drag it through, it was able to slip. Whereas this is a very small piece of fabric. So there still can be problems with this machine if you're working on a full sail. Because if you haven't got an easy method of moving that sail through the machine or somebody helping you, you can still have problems where it, it pulls off to one side. So that's partly to do with the size of the job. Should we plug it in and see if the electric motor will drive it through? Sure. So I just need to put the belt on. One thing about a sail right, it doesn't have a light. <laughs> Which is a bit cheap, really. They don't sell it with a light? No, you can buy the light as an extra, but it's a magnet and has a separate plug. Ah. Um, it wouldn't be difficult to fit a light under this machine that would right. work when you plugged in, but, but they, they have, for whatever re ever reason, they haven't. So with the design of this machine, there's no light built into there's it? There's no light built into it. Aye. It is kind of at the limit of its of its capability. Twelve I, layers. I can, yeah, of I like... can kind of I can feel it struggling. Would you ever actually sew through twelve layers of sail material when you're? Only for a demo for Drake Paragon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're working around the corners of a sail, especially if it's a big sail, you can have a lot of pieces of fabric coming together at, at the corners. Um, so potentially, yeah, you could end up sewing through a lot of sail. It's not something you'd be doing often. Normally, two if you're sewing panels together, four if you're sewing on like um, a leech tape or, or, a, or a luff tape. Patching, you're probably only sewing through two or three. So most of the times you're not sewing through that, but having the capability to do that means that working on two, three or four layers is well within the capabilities of the machine. So the machine is not struggling. I can feel it's kind of, it's, it's like, oh, it's asking me, what am I making it do? So it's, you know, we're, we're kind of getting to the limits of its capability there. This machine's not, just for sail repair you can also use it for other things that you do on a boat like cockpit cushions or yeah, yeah. Your cushions do you want to pass me that basket so this is a couple of things that i put together just as a little a little kind of demo so this is leather this is very thick thick very thick leather five six mil what's wow. that in quarter inch yeah Wow. Something like that. <laughs> I mean, that only just goes under the foot. So I, I don't know if this is going to work. Right. Yeah, so, so it's had a skip stitch there. That happened all the time when I was sewing the patch under my mane. It skipped a stitch. Yeah, skipping stitches is what happens when you're reaching the limit of the machine. Right. There are a couple of things you can do. You can use a bigger needle. Uh, you can put a little bit more presser foot tension on. 
Sometimes a little bit of oil can help. You can oil the thread and it, uh, and it makes it work a little bit better. We'll try that one again, try that with a straight stitch. Look at that thickness of that. That's insane. Yeah. That's unbelievable. The zigzag, it skipped one, but, but on a straight stitch, it's, it's not an issue. That's kind of shown you the really the limits it's not going to sew any more than that and it's kind of on the edge of its capabilities at that point mm -hmm. and that's with a new needle a lot of people don't change their needles until the needle breaks you should be changing the needle every eight hours of work in factories they'll often change a needle at the beginning of a shift so then you're always working with a new needle how does a needle deteriorate over use they can distort so it changes the shape of them basically the way it works a needle has a, a little scooped out shape called a scarf the thread is held across the scarf and the hook hooks up the thread in that scarf if there's any movement on the needle it's not in the right place for the hook to pick it up and that's what can cause skipped stitches and that one skipped stitch there it might be that the needle was slightly deflected in one direction or the other and that has caused it to miss the hook the other thing is the end of the needle the point can get dull or it can get distorted and that will cause the needle to deflect as it goes through the fabric so it might it might go in in one direction or the other direction rather than going straight through that means that the needle is not in the right place for the hook to pick up the the thread so having a new needle and a sharp needle is really important mm. if you want to be at the top of your game for sewing i mean if you're just doing a quick thing with a little bit of soft light fabric it's probably not going to be an issue, but if you're doing sail work, then having a good needle is really important. This is some thin rubber, which has its own issues, so I thought I would give that a try and see what it's like. Four layers of rubber mat. And again, I've never tried this, so I don't know what it will do. No problem. <laughs> so that's well within its capabilities. So we'll go straight up to eight layers. Yeah, so you can see we've got a couple of skip stitches. We're at the limit of what's possible with the machine. It's always good to have a machine that is capable of doing more than you need to do. So you're well within the machine's design scope. So this machine would have no problem making anything on a boat. Cockpit cushions made of vinyl. Cockpit cushions, interior. you can make sails. You can sew the stretchy stuff that people use for fender covers. Any kind of stretchy fabric is quite difficult to sew with a standard machine, but a walking foot um, handles the stretchy fabrics much better. Can this sewing machine sew clothing as well as sewing machines that aren't made for sail repair? It'll do things like jeans, sweatshirt material, that kind of thing, but delicate fabrics like thin cottons and silks and things like that. The teeth and the amount of force that there is on the walking foot is gonna cause problems with delicate fabrics. Really delicate stuff. Yeah. This is an old pair of jeans, so I'll do a little bit on that. That looks perfect. There's your denim. Huh. So you think it might have some issues with a light cotton fabric? That does look like pretty light stuff. Yeah, we'll give it a try and see see what it does. It's not massively delicate, but it's quite a fine it looks like cotton. Yeah, you see what's happening? See, it's kind of ruffling up. Wow. The stitching is fine, but it's whether or not that is going to work for whatever it is that, so, you're, that yeah, you want to it's make. Yeah, ruffled up the fabric. <clears throat> yeah, so that was kind of working at the the maximum of its capabilities mm. as far as thickness and, and um, kind of heavy duty is concerned and that is kind of pushing it at the other end of the spectrum so, but the thing is if you want to sew something like that there are millions of machines out there that you can pick up for you know between 10 and 20 dollars or, or 10 and 20 pounds in charity shops or on facebook or on ebay and they are domestic machines that are perfectly suited to, to sewing this right 
So, you know, why why would you saw something like that on a sale right when there are lots of other machines available that, that, that are designed to do that? Right. So if you're doing sales repairs or you're doing like canopy work on, on your board or cockpit cushions, upholstery, leather work. I don't know for sure, but I would say denim is probably at the bottom end of it, of, of where it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, or something of a, of a denim kind of thickness mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the denim has its own inherent strength which will keep it together whereas something delicate like that it's not strong enough to resist the compression of the feet there's things you can do to to, to try to coax it through the delicate end in the same way as you can coax domestic machines to do a little bit better at the top oh, yeah. end but what's the point you know you can you can pick up a really cheap machine that's very light a couple of kilos and it will sew this stuff no problem at all. Are there any other machines that are competing directly with the sale right machine? Are there any? Ooh, that's the contentious issue. Isn't oh, it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll uh, the boating community will no doubt have a lot, of, a lot of comments to say about that. So, sale right was a company that were making machines for quite a long time for the boat industry. In fact, I have another one over there. If you want to have a look. Sure. This one's about 35 kilos. That's a Sailrite machine. This is an earlier Sailrite model. This is quite old and damaged now. This is this came in for a repair. Wow. But you might recognize the wheel. Oh, it's, it's the same as on it's the... It's the same monster wheel, yeah. It has a 12 millimeter zigzag, which is great for doing sail work. That was some of the demo that I did after I repaired it. And you can see the size of the zigzag. It's a much bigger zigzag than the modern Sailrite will do. Wow. This is based on a Singer machine. It's based on a Singer 20U. So, so Sailrite basically bought these machines and then, and then adapted them for uh, marine work and for boat work. This was used locally on Shetland for doing sail repairs for years and years. This is one of the things that Sailrite were doing. They were, bu they were buying machines from manufacturers and then they were adapting them for sail work. And there was a machine called the Thompson Walker. It's still available on the internet so you can, you can find out all the history about them. The guy who has Sailrite, he went into cooperation with Thompson and either bought the patent or did some kind of uh, cooperation and then he took the Thompson Walker and then adapted the design of it to become what you now know as the Sailrite. And if you look at a Thompson Walker and you look at a Sailrite, they look very, very similar. So that machine kind of existed as the Thompson and then Sailrite took it over, developed it and then had it manufactured to be a Sailrite machine. Hmm. There's a whole contentious um, history where they had it manufactured abroad, I think in Taiwan to begin with, and then there were problems with the factories and copies of the machines turning up in different places. Don't quote me, I may be wrong, but I think that their manufacturing is now done in China and they found a factory that they were happy with. So the basic machine is manufactured and then shipped to America and then Sailrite do the finish and assembly and kind of put it together for, for sale. Hmm. So that's my understanding of how it is. I could be wrong, so please don't uh, fire lots of comments at me <laughs> if, I, if I am wrong in that. But well, aren't there like copycats of the Sailrite machine? Or yeah, like, so there's the competition out there. So the, there are still a lot of co of. I don't know if they're copies or they're, or they're just the same machine um, being produced by different factories. You can get on eBay and you can buy a, one of these machines direct from China. Those machines look just like the Sailrite machine except they're different colors. Yeah, so I had one for a little while and when I compared the two, the build quality of the white copy I got was nothing like the build quality of the Sailrite. Okay. Uh, it was obviously done in a different factory. The casting was not up to scratch. I was able to get it cheap but it didn't last that long i worked it quite hard and the sort of skipping stitches that you can see on all of those layers i was starting to get that on two and three layers of dacron so that was when i kind of realized i'd, I'd push this machine a little bit beyond its, its so capabilities they are not as good as the sailor they're machine. definitely not as they, good as they the look like the sailor machine they, they look like it they do the same job but the build quality is not as good. And the other thing is you've got no comeback. You know, a, a machine turns up in a box from China with a customs label on it. You get it out, put it together, use it. If anything goes wrong with it, trying to get a repair done or trying to get parts, I found it became very difficult mm -hmm. to the point where I used that machine till it broke and then I gave it away. Whereas with Sailrite, they offer great customer service. Yeah, yeah. That Now that I've got a Sailrite, 
I will probably keep that for my, for life. Yeah. You know, because I know that I can get in touch with Sailorite. I can get parts. I can change that easily. I would say the Sailorite is worth hanging on to for that. Whereas the other one, it was disposable. And because I got it quite cheap, it didn't have the same value to me. Uh, and I was like, it was it was almost a disposable piece that I used. And when it stopped working, I was like, oh, it only it didn't cost much. I'll just get another one. I have to say, I enjoy the Sailorite. Whereas the the other one I had, the Chinese one, it was more like it was a functional thing that I that I would like. Oh, I need to get that out, and I need to do that, mm. and it would be like a chore. Whereas I actually enjoy getting the sale right out, and and I enjoy I enjoy because I know it's going to do a, do a, a decent job, or or it's going to do the job that I wanted to do, and that's a nice thing to have. And most of the machines I go for, I keep them because they give me pleasure to use them. Um, and that that makes a big difference to your life you know kind of that kind of like well-being is is a is a really nice thing and how do you put a value on that i've no idea but i value the machine for that more than i value it possibly for its actual capabilities as a sewing machine mm. because as i said it's not the best sewing machine in the world but it is the best that I'm aware of for the jobs that I want to do with it and the environment that I want to take it into. So that for, for me, that's that's what I like about it. First it time using a sale rate machine. <laughs> no pressure. All right, here we go. I'm gonna... ah. Wow. I can't believe how slow that can go. I just keep thinking about how hard it was for me to sew that patch onto my mainsail, and I can see with this it would have it would have been no problem. Oh, that's beautiful! I like the color. So this is an electric machine, and this has a whole range of fancy stitches. This one has a little surprise as well. 